It's wonderful to be recognized. I'll tell you, at times being recognized can, can not go the way you think it's going to go. Shortly after I got elected to the Board of Supervisors in 2018, very tough campaign, uh, very contentious campaign, millions of dollars spent, and we won a decisive victory. And I was feeling really good, and then I get sworn in, and I'm feeling really good. And then just a few days after I get sworn in, I'm walking out of the county building, and it's one of those glorious San Diego evenings down on the waterfront, and the fountains are going, and the kids are playing, and I'm feeling good about life. And these two sweet ladies stop me, and they said, oh my god, I can't believe you're here. And I thought, well, yeah, it was, I mean, it was a tough campaign, but we're here. And they were so excited. They said, we're so excited to meet you and to see you, and I'm feeling really good about life. And I was like, well, I'm excited to be here. And they said, oh my gosh, can we take a picture? And I said, of course, yeah, we can take a picture. And so I stand there glowing between the two of them, smiling, and uh, I'm stepping away from them. I said, I got to run now. Y'all have a wonderful evening. Thank you for being so kind. It uplifted my day. And they said, oh my god, no, thank you. And, and I get about three steps away, and I hear one of them look at the other and say, oh my god. Did you have any idea that today we would meet Gavin Newsom? <laughs> <laughs> and it took me a minute because he is much taller, he is much prettier, he is much more important. And I thought, gosh, do I, do I tell him? And then I was like, well, but if I don't tell him, they're going to post the picture and everyone's going to be like, that's not Gavin Newsom. And so I go and I tell him, I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, not, I'm not Gavin Newsom. And they're like, really? And I'm like, no, and you can tell they're just deflated. And one lady goes, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Nathan Fletcher. And she's like, what do you do? And, uh, but that was still better than uh, what may happen post-COVID a little bit. Some guy stopped me and he said, anyone tell you you look like that Nathan Fletcher guy? <laughs> and now I'm hedging my bets, right? And I said, I get that from time to time. And he said, it must really piss you off. <laughs> and I thought, well, I, I heard he's all right. You know, I don't know. Um, you know, I want to talk to you uh, just, just for, a, for a few moments today about this notion of fighting forward and kind of resilience. Um, and just share with you some personal stories from, from my life that have certainly shaped how I approach the world and approach professional life and, and personal life and some lessons that I try and instill not only in our five kids but in, in anyone that may have the opportunity to, to come apart. And, you know, in San Diego, the Fletcher name is a very famous name. Uh, a long history in San Diego of, of powerful Fletcher families. You have Fletcher Cove and Fletcher Parkway and Fletcher Hills. Um, also not my Fletcher family at all. Like, if you know them and they want to put me in their will, I, I will gladly uh, uh, carry on the name, but, but not, not actual relationship. I, uh, I grew up in a hard scrapping, blue collar factory working family in the rural south. Um, and, you know, growing up in that environment, my stepdad uh, was a laborer at the International Paper Plant. And they were multiple generations of factory workers that would go and uh, show up the Monday after they graduated high school. They would get their steel-toed boots and their union card, uh, and they would work. And there was a social contract that you would work hard for 25, 30 years, and if you didn't get hurt, a lot of them got hurt, then you would have a modest retirement and, and you would go on around your way. And as a kid, when the wind would blow a certain way, you could smell the paper mill. And if you've never smelled a paper mill, it is not a pleasant smell. And I remember as a kid, my parents would always say, it smells like bacon and eggs. And I was so perplexed because I'm like, no, it smells like raw sewage. And so finally, I said, somebody explain this to me. I don't understand. And they said, because that's where the paycheck comes from. And the paycheck is what buys your bacon and eggs. And that's why it smells like bacon and eggs. Um, but you know, growing up in that environment, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot. It was a small town, 1,100 people in our little town, smack over Arkansas. It was sumac covert. It was French. And they just put it together and took out all the accent. And one stoplight uh, works most of the time. Uh, our school colors are black and white. They said we were too poor to afford color. <laughs> I would be like, Northlet has red in there. You know, well, you don't get color. You're from Smackover. Our uniforms are black and white. Uh, but you know, a few years ago, I, I took my wife uh, back to my hometown. And uh, I hadn't been back in a while. My mom, who still lives there, prefers to come out here and, and see the grandkids. But we went to the little house that I grew up in. And, and I, I vividly remember looking at it and being a little shocked and taking a picture and texting it to my mom and saying, Mom, it was it was a little nicer. And she said, no, that's, that's what it is. 
And I said, well, it was certainly a little bigger. And she's like, no, you were, you were just smaller. <laughs> and it was a very humble upbringing. Uh, and in all the struggles that go through there, I took out of there the value of hard work, the importance of hard work. You get up and you have purpose and you work hard. But in a community like that, it's still a community that looks out for one another. People know each other. If your car breaks down on the side of the road, every single car in that town will stop to ask if you need help. Not one person will drive by you because there's that sense of the community. And I think that there's a little bit we've lost there of looking out for one another and recognizing that we are all in this together. Um, but I'd certainly learned the value and dignity and hard work in the community looking out for each other. Now, the path for how I got to that community probably had an even more profound role in my life uh, than the lessons I learned there. The reality is I was the child of a teenage mother uh, who was in a violent and horrible domestic violence situation uh, with a really awful biological father. Uh, through a series of really unfortunate and, and at times bizarre sounding circumstances, that teenage mother lost custody of her child, which left me in the hands uh, of a violent and unstable biological father for most of the first eight years of life. And the simple reality is, is that I had to learn resilience, persevere, and grit as a function of survival, as a means of surviving. Incredible trauma and hardship and difficulty. I also had to figure out a way for how you instinctively learn to fight forward, meaning that you think about the challenges that are ahead of you because you don't really want to relive the past and where you've been. And, and all of our life experience shapes us, and it, it drives us. And the past is very important. You need to address it, you need to understand it, you need to recognize how it motivates you. But I think that we all spend a far too much of our time living in grievances, complaints, frustrations of the past. Instead of focusing on what is ahead of us that we can do to truly make the world a better place. And so out of that, I think came, yes, a tremendous resilience, but a great ability to think about looking forward and in watching what my mother did with the rest of her life is the first true instilling in me of a commitment to public service. You see, my mom took that experience as a teenager and what she went through in losing her child, what her child went through and what she went through in getting back, and has dedicated her entire professional life to running shelters for battered women and children. A crime victim advocate, someone who advocates for those. Uh, an incredible testament of the hardship and difficulty she's willing to relive and endure because she wants to make it better for someone else. And that really meant something to me when I was reunited and rekindled with her to watch her struggles and what she went through and the tremendous successes she's had. I used to say that neither of my parents had graduated college, and that was true until three years ago when my mom, as a grandma, went back and graduated from college and got her degree in social work. She went on to get her master's degree. You can applaud for that. She now repeatedly reminds me she's better educated than I am. Uh, but she had her cap and gown, and she was beautiful. I wanted a bumper sticker that said, my mom is an honor student. I was so incredibly proud of her. But you know, the childhood where I grew up, you know, that, that notion of hard work was instilled at an early age. At age 12, I had Fletcher Yard Service. That was a one-man yard service business, the one 12-year-old uh, that could convince people to pay me to let, let me cut their grass and edge and rake. Uh, I spent time in construction sites at a young age. You had to help and participate and pay back. Uh, I was an athlete uh, in high school and later in college, but in order to be able to practice and play sports in the afternoon, I had to find a way to work in the morning. And so I took the job as janitor in the movie theater one town over from us, and I got up at 4 a.m. every morning, seven days a week, and I cleaned that movie theater before school so that I could both help out and be able to participate in sports. I was able to go to college. The first, neither of my parents had graduated until recently my mom did, but. I had a scholarship, an academic scholarship, and a little bit of extra one because I could hit a baseball. But you know, that scholarship doesn't buy you jeans, and it doesn't help with the expenses that you endure. And so again, in college, I learned those lessons of hard work, driving forklifts and lumber yards. Uh, I remember one summer when I was working, the entirety of the engine in my car blew, and it took every dollar I had or I could borrow to get my car fixed. And so for three weeks, until I could catch up a little bit, I ate every meal I had at the mobile gas station because for some reason, the mobile company sent me a credit card in the mail. 
And every day when I'd go in, I just prayed that that day it would not get declined. But all of these are lessons that, that we carry forward as we move forward, the value of hard work and the discipline. My first real opportunity to serve came when I joined the Marine Corps. And I did that as a teenager. That's what brought me to San Diego, the yellow footprints I stood on there. And I've got a bias towards Marines because I'm a Marine and we love all the branches of services. But I'll tell you, when you watch a Navy ad or an Army ad, they say, hey, get money for college and see the world and we'll get you a skill that you can take into a job when you're out. But Marine Corps ads don't say that. Marine Corps ads say there are those among us who run towards the sound of danger, towards the sound of injustice and tyranny and oppression, towards those in need of help. And that resonated with me. Because, you know, I saw those ads and I thought, you know what, that's what my mom does. That's exactly what my mom does. So I can do what my mom does with a really cool uniform. <laughs> Sign me up. And, you know, my 10 years in service, uh, including multiple combat deployments, Iraq, Yemen, the Somali region of Africa, all those lessons I had learned in life were put to the test when you were literally facing life and death situations. The concept of fighting forward, looking in front of you, is so vitally important on a combat deployment because the only day that matters is today and what's in front of you. It doesn't matter what you survived the day before, it's what are you gonna do today moving forward. And coming out of those, I think one, I have a real commitment to peace. I will tell you there is no one who wants peace more than someone who's seen combat. I think I have a deep appreciation for the reality that we don't talk enough about the lasting harm of combat and the moral harm and the generational impact of what happens. And when we pick our conflicts in the future, we ought to pick a little bit more carefully. Because one of the reasons my generation has had such incredible struggles is not that we minded sacrificing, not that we minded what we went through, we mind that it didn't count for anything. We fought in the two longest wars in the history of our nation, and in both cases, we made a bad situation worse or at most charitable maintain the status quo. And now as I stand before you, not just as a Marine Corps veteran, but a Marine Corps dad, with my oldest son serving on active duty, it changes how you think about it. You also have an intense commitment understanding the scars of war and understanding the long-term impact of war that we all carry with us in one way or another to making sure that we are doing a better job addressing this. And so when my 10-year career in the military came up, I realized I wanted to continue to serve. I accepted the fact I couldn't have the really cool uniform anymore. Uh, so I ran for the state legislature and, uh, and got elected. And, uh, was the youngest member uh, of the legislature when I was sworn in there, not in history, but at that time serving. Uh, but in spite of tremendous difficulty in that time, I had 23 pieces of legislation signed into bill, worked very closely with Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor Brown. I will tell you, you could not have two more fundamentally different humans on the planet. <laughs> I mean, like top to bottom, completely different uh, individuals, but I'm very fond of, uh, of both of them and have remained in touch with both of them. Uh, but served as best I could and then was really feeling good and came home and ran for mayor. Somebody told me the other day, they said, I forgot you ran for mayor. I said, I try and forget all the time too. <laughs> uh, I will tell you in that campaign, I had the highest level of support of any of the candidates among San Diegans who don't vote. <laughs> no, I killed it. I was the choice of non-voters. I mean, I overwhelmingly won non-voters, um, which I've come to realize uh, not necessarily the most important coalition of folks when you're trying to get elected. Uh, but you know, after that, I wandered a little bit, and this brings me to UCSD. Uh, I went into corporate life and was treated wonderfully and got some great experiences, uh, but hated it. I mean, they treated me wonderful, and I had a you know, good experience, but it did not, I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. It didn't motivate me, it didn't drive, it didn't connect with me. And I think in large part in that difficult few years where I was wandering a little bit, what kept me rooted and kept me coming back was the work I did for UC San Diego. You see, Jeff Elman, who many of you know or had the opportunity to know uh, in his life, was a wonderful, wonderful individual. And him and Professor Thad Kauser, who's now the chair of the political science department, they took me to lunch and they said, would you like to be a professor? Now, I don't have a PhD. And I said, I would, and I'd also like to be an astronaut. I'd like to be a trauma surgeon. Like, there's a lot of things I'd like to do, but I got kids and a mortgage, and they said, we have this position, professor of practice, and we think it'd be just right for you. And they took a chance on me. And I will tell you, it has been the greatest experience I've had. 10 years in January, I will have been a professor of practice at UC San Diego teaching in poli-sci, 
undergrad but upper division, and those students inspire me, and they motivate me. And teaching and talking, it is a wonderful thing. And I can't believe they pay me to do it. I'd, probably, I'd do it even if they didn't pay me, because the, what I get out of there, and on, even today, I don't teach as much now, but I still continue to teach. But on the most frustrating days where I'm beat down and I'm thinking none of what we do makes a difference, I go up to campus and I teach a class. And I see the excitement and the energy that comes out of our students, and I leave feeling better and thinking much better about life. And what UC San Diego brings to our region is so important and so massive. Did a lot of work around deported veterans, bringing folks back, and then in 2018 had the opportunity to run for the Board of Supervisors, not with a goal of winning an election, but with a goal of transforming an entity. Taking a county Board of Supervisors, a $7 billion a year entity with almost 20,000 employees, and pointing it in a new direction. And we have made historic investments in mental health and substance abuse. We have changed our approach around climate change, around housing, around the investments that we make. Fundamentally different approach when it comes to helping refugees and immigrants. Uh, and I have enjoyed all of the work to do, but I will tell you that there was no part of my campaign for office in 2018 where I said, you know, when I get elected, I'm going to close restaurants, bars, and schools. <laughs> we had a pandemic uh, interrupt us. And if there was ever a moment where you needed to have gone through a whole lot of tough experience in life to prepare you for a situation, it was certainly COVID, where daily we had to confront the unknowns of what we didn't know. Every decision we made in COVID was a bad decision because the only options I had in front of me were a bad option and a worse option. And so we took the bad option, not because it was good, but because it was the least bad thing that we had. We did our level best to be transparent and be open and tell people this is what we're doing and why, and then when it changed, explain why it changed. And despite all the protest and the people lighting my house on fire and all the other stuff that, that comes around that, San Diego did well. We did well. It was hard. It was hard on everyone. It was hard on parents who had young kids. I know. That was us. It was hard on seniors who were isolated. It was hard on small businesses with changing rules and open, close. It was incredibly hard on our healthcare personnel who had to go to work every day and often be the only person there to say goodbye. But as I stand before you today in San Diego County, 94% of eligible San Diegans have gotten a vaccine, one of the highest vaccination rates in the nation. We also have, per person, one of the lowest death rates in the nation, one half that the state of Florida adjusted for person. Lower than the state of California, lower than any surrounding county, and we have an unemployment rate that's lower than the national average. And so we have a lot of challenges in front of us as we move ahead. The homeless crisis is a crisis rooted in poverty, along with a historic inability to provide mental health and substance abuse treatment the way it should be designed as a part of health, not something separate. Issues around homelessness, housing, the cost of living that we will continue to tackle and drive forward. But every day, and I'll just say in closing, what motivates me every single day is the why that I do my job. Because I know why I do it. Public office is public service, and I have the opportunity to improve the lives of the constituents that I represent. What I do today is no different than what I did as a Marine. It's no different than what my mom did. And so I always encourage my students, as you find a profession, look for something where the why resonates and connects with you. And it doesn't matter what it is. It can be in any field. But the how, the what, the where, the when, the how much, all of that is going to be for naught if you don't have something that motivates you for why you do it. And continue to look forward and look ahead. I've had a lot of failures in life. I've had a lot of mistakes. I have a lot of flaws. But every day we get up and we look ahead. And sometimes it can frustrate my team. We'll have a tremendous win, a huge policy victory. And unfortunately, my response is, what's next? because it is always looking ahead for what else and what mother group we can help. And the sign outside my office, written on a whiteboard, it says, we only do hard things. All right, someone else got elected, they can do easy things. We didn't get elected to do easy things. We got elected to do hard things. The second one says, Fortez, Fortuna, Juvat, fortune favors the bold. And the third says, you're never out of the fight. You can be knocked back, you can be knocked down, you can be knocked out, but you are never out of the fight and making a difference if you get up every single day with a relentless focus on fighting forward. Thank you so very, very much for letting me join you today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.